Good morning, students. Uh, yesterday, we had seen uh, how women had been wholeheartedly participating in the civil disobedience movement, which had been launched by Mahatma Gandhi in 1930. And uh, especially their contribution gets highlighted precisely because of the fact that a lot of men had been arrested. And it was in their absence that they carried on this mass movement and this agitation. And um, some critics have argued, that's what we saw yesterday, that uh, yes, Gandhiji should have actually used this opportunity to talk about uh, the, in, uh, the emancipation and empowerment of uh, women of uh, India. But uh, Congress lost this opportunity of doing so. And uh, I give you the reason why uh, it was that, because uh, a con a Congress also had to students, the main objective was to ensure the um, uh, the return of uh, British uh, from India. It was once that was done, uh, everything could be taken care of later. You could not be picking up all the frontiers together and then trying to antagonize different sections of the society throw open different debates within the society uh, at a point when the only primary objective should have been uh, the freedom struggle, the freedom against the British rule in India. So that's why Congress did not uh, touch this, uh, this whole topic of uh, women's liberation. Now, today we talk about the limits of civil disobedience. Not all social groups were moved by the abstract concepts of Swaraj. Now, one such, such group was Nations Untouchables, who from around the 1930s had began to call themselves Dalit or the oppressed. For long, the Congress had ignored the Dalits for fear of offending the Sanatanis, the conservative high caste Hindus. But Mahatma Gandhi declared that Swaraj would not come for a hundred for years if untouchability was not eliminated. He called untouchability, um, untouchables the Harijans or the children of God organized Satyagraha to secure them entry into temples and access to uh, public wells, tanks, roads and schools. He himself cleaned toilets to, uh, to basically to set an example. But many Dalit leaders were keen on a different political solution to the problems of the community. Um, they began organizing themselves, demanding reserved seats in educational institution and a separate electorate that would choose Dalit members for legislative councils. Political empowerment, they believed, would resolve the problems of their social disabilities. Dalit participation in the civil disobedience movement was therefore limited, particularly in the Maharashtra and Nagpur region where their organization was quite strong. Now, students, you have to understand that you see, uh, oh, this is not something which uh, you would come to know only if I tell you. Now, you see all around you, every, in, 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 and I see it all around me, all of us see it all around us in our daily lives that the caste system in India is extremely strong and it thrives, you know. And we do talk about all of us being equal and all of us being, you know, created equally by God and all that talk. Definitely, it uh, we love to talk in uh, these uh, kind of lines and in and this fashion. But the reality always remains is that the caste system, the community system, uh, it is extremely strong and robust, okay? And it has been thriving for thousands of years in India, okay? Sometimes, yes, sometimes it has been extremely strong, sometimes less so. But no one can ever say that a caste system, once it caught up, uh, let me uh, reiterate here, once it caught up, it ever faded away. It never did. Uh, of course, in the early days, uh, Rig Veda um, uh, times, uh, caste system was much more, uh, um, 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 or rather, Rig Veda times uh, talk about the Varna system. But the caste system came much later, and uh, in early years, it was much more liberal. Okay, it was more guided by the uh, by the profession that you chose. For example, uh, if a Brahmin became uh, a warrior, he would uh, then be known as a Kshatriya. In a similar fashion, if a Kshatriya became a, a very learned man and a Maharishi or something like that, then he would be uh, known as a Brahmin. So it was very flexible in those years, and that's how Rig Veda wanted it. But it was very, uh, but gradually, gradually, as the complexities in societies started uh, going up, 
the, the whole structure became much more complex. These things started becoming much more rigid. And by 20th century, that is, we are talking about uh, by the time 1800s and 1900s, it was the caste system had become so strong that people who were at the top of the pyramid, that is, people like Brahmins and Kshatriyas, they didn't have a problem because they presided at the top. But those who were at the bottom, the uh, uh, you know, it became worse and worse and worse and worse you know uh, if you talk about uh, the condition of the people from the lower castes they were never treated as untouchables in india but it was after after some some centuries some centuries they actually uh, were uh, uh, typecast as uh, um, you know uh, unlucky people and if you you know you, the people whom you should stay away from and uh, everything all kind of stigma and prejudice got attached to them and by 19th century and uh, 20th century uh, it had become very very cemented and uh, no one wanted now to touch that issue though everyone could see it that it was extremely damaging for not just these people but also for the society as a whole but no one wanted to touch uh, this uh, uh, this hornet's nest uh, and antagonize the upper caste Hindus because that would um, really kind of divide the whole society but Mahatma Gandhi uh, took this issue uh, head on and it, because he strongly believed that uh, uh, if, you know if we we can keep uh, uh, fighting all uh, external opponents uh, whether British or whoever for that matter but if we do not actually take care of the fault lines which are within the society it would not be sustainable. You kick out the British from India and the millions of Indians themselves are in abject condition of recognition, poverty, prejudice, casteism. That would be no freedom at all. And this is what Mahatma Gandhi uh, was extremely uh, passionate about and he had made it very clear in all and in, 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 in all his literature and he always used to talk about it that nothing would come out of it as long as a significant section of the population lived under enormous amount of prejudice. But looking from the perspective of the oppressed Dalit class, they felt that for the first time Okay, someone was paying attention to them, not that Gandhi was paying attention to them, no. They felt for the first time that, yes, guys, I told this yesterday as well. You know, Dalits were okay about British ruling India because they knew that, yes, this British guy has nothing against me because I come from a lower caste community, unlike an Indian. Though uh, Indian, he was an Indian and everyone else was an Indian, but he felt that his condition was far worse under an Indian rule and under Indians rather than the British rule and under the British because British was not bothered about their, their caste system at all, but Indians definitely were. And uh, that is the reason why the civil disobedience movement uh, they, uh, the Dalits and the oppressed class, they saw this civil disobedience movement entirely in a different fashion. Okay, they felt that yes, uh, we would go a separate way, and we would like to extract rights for our own people. Okay, our reason would be that our rationale would be that from the British, we should have a separate line of communication with the British. Okay, because um, uh, students, you have to understand, though it is not there, I'm sure not in this chapter, uh, you have to understand that British were far more evolved people, at least in those years, than we ever were at that point in time. You know, uh, British were responsible for actually uh, uh, supporting uh, Indian, uh, uh, you know, civil rights and uh, many people who were talking about equality and freedom for the oppressed sections of the society. And they were extremely sympathetic to uh, the harmful practices which had 
creeped in uh, the Hindu and the Indian society. Uh, things, practices like uh, uh, sati, the practice of uh, uh, you know widow never being allowed to marry, uh, the practice of uh, child marriage. In a, uh, you know the, the British were completely against all these things, and uh, the social reformers uh, of India, people like Raja Ram Mohan Roy, people like uh, Ishwar Chand Vidya Sagar, they got you know enormous amount of encouragement from the British to actually throw these evil practices out of uh, the social calendar of Indians and Hindus. Okay, so uh, British were far more evolved that way and the Dalits felt that uh, the British would be you know far better in uh, dealing with uh, and extracting their civil rights their social rights compared to and they would be far more accommodating than Indians would ever be willing to so uh, Dalits uh, never quite trusted uh, uh, the Indian community and the Congress leadership when it came to their own respective rights and that is what we see that um, they started even asking for separate electorates. Now students what do you mean by separate electorates? Now this is something which needs to be uh, uh, if you can understand this in detail it would be great you know that's how even today's politics Indian politics um, is one is some or is somewhat or the other it is still guided by these ideas. Now what is a concept of separate, separate electorate. Now the, the, the Dalits always felt that they are under such a, a unfavorable, uh, they are at the unfavorable end precisely because um, they do not share the political power. Okay, they don't have any political power and because they do not have any political power, they cannot make laws. They cannot, uh, they cannot guide how the system needs to be run. And uh, that is why Dalits were extremely keen to participate in the political affairs of the country and hold real political power. And that is why, but they understood that if a Dalit stands for election, say for uh, uh, students, uh, you have to understand that now we are talking about 100 years ago, okay? So if uh, they felt that uh, the Dalits of, say for example, Dehradun, if they felt that if they have a Dalit representative who stands from Dehradun for some, some election or the other, the people of Dehradun would not be voting for him, students. Today, it doesn't matter for us at all whether someone comes from this caste, that caste. We just see uh, while uh, electing our representatives that yes, whether this person is capable enough, whether this person is honest enough, whether he would be good for this uh, profile, he would be bad for this profile and uh, his integrity, his honesty, uh, how good or bad his name is. They, these are the only things which matter to us. But, in, but 100 years ago, you know, the things, these things, that is the caste, your community, your varna, all the, the upper caste, the lower caste, these things were extremely important. And Dalits understood that if, even if they wanted to stand for uh, uh, elections, uh, it would be extremely difficult for their candidate to make it. And that is why they wanted separate electorates. Now, what would se the concept of separate electorate would mean? Now, what they, what they said is, the Dalits, Dalits should be voting only for Dalits. That was the concept of separate electorate. Okay, yes, they said that yes, uh, the, uh, the contestants or the candidates would be Dalits and certain areas should be aligned and assigned that yes, these are the areas where only Dalits can contest and in these areas only the Dalits would be voting for Dalits. But Mahatma Gandhi felt that this would be dividing the whole society. Okay, he and that is what we see in uh, and Dr. Bhimra Ambedkar, who organized the Dalits into the Depressed Classes Association in 1930, clashed with Gandhi at the second round table conference by demanding separate electorates for Dalits because he said, yes, at the time of voting, because in any case, uh, if uh, everyone voted, then naturally the chances of make a Dalit candidate winning the election would be extremely slim. So uh, we should have um, Dalits voting for Dalits. Now this is something which Gandhiji was extremely um, kind of against because he felt that it would clearly um, divide the society. Now some of the Muslim political organizations when in India were also lukewarm in their response to the civil disobedience movement. 
After the decline of non-cooperation Khilafat movement, a large section of Muslims felt, uh, uh, you know, alienated from the whole uh, freedom movement that was going on. Okay, thank you.